I just wanted to share some thoughts, something a little bit different than what I normally talk about. First, I do want to say thanks to everyone who has subscribed and liked the videos and commented. When I first started this channel, um, my channel, I'd had the channel for quite a while and hadn't used it for anything, but I decided to start using it to make these types of videos a little over a year ago, I guess. And I went from having maybe six followers or subscribers to now over 900. And we're pushing for a thousand, so y'all help us out. <laughs> but um, I want to say thanks once again to everyone who does take the time to watch. Because I don't have that big of a following, so it means more to me when I see that people are liking and, and commenting. I wanted to also do a little follow-up on the story that I did a few days ago about the missing woman from Pike County, Kentucky, Trish Walters. Last night, um, Kentucky State Police and um, others posted that she has been located and she is safe. She is alive and she had left on her own, as far as they know. They had been tracking her, I guess, across a couple of different states. I don't know if she'd gone on a trip and forgot to tell anybody or just needed some time away. But apparently she had been using uh, transactions of her debit card or something of that nature so they were able to locate her and talk to her and that was really all the details that they gave because she is an adult she had left on her own so they wasn't going to give out her you know location or anything but that story has been you know resolved right now i just want to say to the people suffering from this horrible hurricane helene um, especially the people in the Appalachian area of western North Carolina, uh, eastern Tennessee. Um, I've been seeing the, so many reports on the Internet, and, of course, we know that you can't believe everything that you see on the Internet, but a lot of people who are actually on the ground out there and who have actually encountered this say that, um, a lot of people are working to block them from helping the people to get supplies to them. And for some reason, um, the people that should be out there helping and should be the first responders are not anywhere to be seen. And the ones that are there are telling people to turn away and go back and are not really there to try to assist, almost to resist. And I don't know how true this is. I, I have had a few people who are actually in that area tell me this. So I hope that this will stop and I hope that they will work to get these supplies to people. They're, and yeah, all around them is just total loss. Businesses completely wiped out. Homes completely wiped out. Lives lost. This is a catastrophic event. And I don't know, um, politics shouldn't play a role in this, but it has. And it's just very sad that as a country, we see the people, and I watched this one video clip yesterday where this woman said, we only have the people, we the people only have, we the people, we only have each other. We can't rely on any help to come to us. They're too busy playing politics. They're too busy campaigning and fundraising and flying around on the people's money across the country, jetting back and forth. And um, instead of really seeing that human beings are suffering, I watched one video yesterday where people went into the mountains in western North Carolina to take insulin and other supplies. You can imagine being an older person sick on, on oxygen, insulin and those type of things and not be able to get out to get help. I hope that they know when they de deliver these supplies to go to the local people, people who actually live there, people who actually know where the need is the greatest, and get these supplies to the people that need them and, and deserve them. It had also been a while since I had brought up or mentioned anything about the Amber Spradlin case going on in Floyd County. 
Now, in my last video update on that, um, the three men, the M.K. McKinney, his father, and their friend that lived with them had all been arrested and charged with her murder, charged with covering up this crime. And um, as of right now, the dentist, Michael McKinney, he, has, uh, he and the other Josh Mullins, they both have been released from jail on, on um, bond. They're both on house arrest and monitoring, but they are allowed to go to work, and the, and the dentist was allowed to return to his office to work. But he did get his dental license reinstated. Um, it had been suspended while they were investigating this. They did feel okay to, you know, return that to him. And as far as I know, he's working and practicing dental, you know, um, doing dental work in his office. I, the last that I heard, his son, M.K. McKinney, who was the one who was actually charged with the murder, is still in jail. And I haven't seen any update on that as of very recently. Um... Now, another big thing that happened recently in that case was the cousin of Amber Spradlin, Debbie Hall, who has led the charge in this this whole time, was recently accused by um, stories were floating around that um, she had had a phone conversation with someone at the jail. I don't know all the details on that. But apparently someone had called her from the jail and I guess she accepted the call. And I don't know if this person was asking her to bail them out of jail, to pay their bail, to get them out of jail. But apparently, now I'm just going by what I've seen on social media. Robbie Williams, who is the county judge, had this tape, this tape, you know, all phone calls from a jail to anyone is recorded. So apparently he had a thumb drive of this conversation between Debbie Hall and this inmate. And in this call, he accused, or, or it was said, it was suggested that he accused Debbie Hall of a murder plot, a murder for hire plot against M.K. McKinney. Now, this was not true at all, and, and I don't think anybody really, maybe a, a small portion of people on the side of this McKinney family may have wanted to believe this, but I don't think anyone else did. I haven't heard the call. I don't know if they plan to release this call to the public, but apparently he was playing this call for other people. And accusing Debbie Hall of, who is a doctor, by the way, and this was very damaging to her reputation. This could have really damaged her career. And personally, you know, to interject my own personal thoughts on this, I think Robbie Williams might want to hold back on his, his personal opinions about people because the civil case has already been filed and this cannot help him. But apparently, Debbie Hall had told this person, no, I don't feel comfortable giving you any money. I hope that you are able to get yourself out of jail. And she said something to the effect of, hopefully, you'll have company. If you, if you don't get out of jail, hopefully, you'll have some company soon, meaning M.K. McKinney. And this was apparently the, the entirety of this conversation and Robbie Williams, the county judge, had gotten a copy of this call. Someone within the jail had had to release that. A jailer, someone who worked within the jail system, had had to record that and give this to him. All these people within the Prestonsburg Police Department the county officials are all named in this uh, civil case for failure. And it was Robbie Williams, my understanding, who led the charge 
to get the 911 system moved from the Kentucky State Police to the Prestonsburg City Police in, in certain areas. Now, in Floyd County, if you called 911 up previously, you would get the Kentucky State Police. They would dispatch them. Once it was moved to Prestonsburg City Police, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because Prestonsburg City, it, it's a it's a good-sized little town. It's not a big city. It's not a metropolis-type city. But it's in Floyd County, and Floyd County is spread out in hills and hollers and little communities like Martin and Hueysville and Betsy Lane, and there's just a lot of little towns and areas in the area. But they failed Amber Spradlin that night because when the first 911 call came in and this man got on the phone, someone called and said there's someone here injured and bleeding and need help. Michael McKinney, this dentist, took the phone from that person and said, no, everything's under control. Don't come. We've got everything under control. It's just a little misunderstanding. No one went out. No one went out to that house that night. Or, the, or It was early in the morning hours. And this was in June. So it was getting pretty close to daylight. It was like 5 a.m. somewhere in that time zone. It would, it would have been around the, maybe it was getting close to shift change or something. I don't know. Maybe that played a role in why they didn't go out. But either way, they didn't go out. And a few hours later, Michael McKinney calls. Now, he calls 911, which is an emergency call. You know, you call for an emergency. I, someone's hurt. There's been an accident. We need help immediately. He had already called several. He had called the uh, chief of police of Prestonsburg, who resigned very soon after all of this, he made some personal phone calls to some officials within the county system prior to calling 911. He asked for um, their opinion, uh, at least one person that he spoke with, he asked for the name of a lawyer. Who can you recommend a lawyer? Now, while all this took place from the time the first call came in, and according to the autopsy and according to what they were able to figure out, that Amber was still alive at that point when that 911 call came in. This is what they think. So sometime between that first call and the time that he made that first call to one of his buddies, she had died. She had been murdered, brutally murdered, stabbed multiple times, put up a fight for her life with at least five other people in the home. And so they failed her by not going out. If one person had just said, you know what? I'm going to run up there. I'm going to send a state police trooper up there. I'm going to send someone, one of the local sheriff's deputies or somebody up there to check this out. See what's going on up there. Make sure that nobody really does need an ambulance or medical help. But they didn't do that. They called and said everything's fine. They let it go. A few hours later, Amber Spradlin is dead, murdered, laying there. And then the cleanup was taking place during those hours between the time that she died from the first call till he called his buddy. They were in the process of cleaning up, trying to get rid of evidence, uh, trying to conceal this murder. They didn't say, you know, we were all drunk as skunks last night and partying all night and everybody was fighting and people were getting stabbed and this girl ends up murdered and stabbed to death. And so... Now, they're trying to demonize Debbie Hall, who's, she was out, as far as I can remember in the story, she was in West Virginia golfing at a golf uh, resort or having some type of golf event going on. She gets a phone call from someone saying, you need to come back to Kentucky. Now, from where she was at to Floyd County, it's roughly about a two-hour drive. So, she returns home to Floyd County and finds out that her cousin Amber is murdered, dead. 
It took a it took a little bit from the time they got the body to Frankfurt and did this autopsy to find out the cause of death. And uh, that's where all this started from. And this cover up has started from day one, from hour one. Okay, so I'm just going to read from this. This is from Fox 56. A Kentucky judge was shot and killed in his courthouse chambers, and the sheriff who charged, who has been charged with his murder is behind bars. Now, this happened on September the 19th. Now, it says here, following an argument. Now, the story is, is that the two of them had known each other for years. Sheriff Mickey Steins had worked as a court bailiff under this judge for years and then he ran for sheriff in 2018 and the two of them knew each other very well and um everybody knows each other just like floyd county all the all the people in within the court system pretty much knows where everybody's at you know but they had lunch together that day Sheriff Steins and Judge Mullins and a couple of other people who worked there in the courthouse. And it was said, uh, somebody there at that luncheon had said that there seemed to be a little tension between the two and they might have exchanged a word or two that wasn't so loud that others were like paying attention to it. But it caught someone's attention that the judge said to the sheriff, do we need to go have a private conversation in my office? something something to that effect so later that day at around 2 45 ish maybe two hours or so after this lunch the sheriff comes to the judge's chambers and the people who work in the outer office where the judge was actually there with them says to them i need to speak to the judge alone now this judge's name is kevin mullins and the two of them went into the judge's chambers and there is a video, and I will play a short clip of that. Um, at some point, it was said, and they don't show the entirety of the video. I haven't seen the entire video. But it was said that the sheriff made a couple of phone calls on his phone, and then he asked the judge for his phone. Now, it was said in the beginning that they exchanged phones. Now, like I said, that's not on this video, so I don't know if the sheriff handed him, handed the judge his phone and vice versa, but I know that he asked for the judge's phone and he handed him the phone. And within a second or two later, he pulls his gun out and he points it at the judge. And he, the judge, you can see on the videos, holding up his hands, not trying to reason with the sheriff to, you know, don't do this, step back, whatever he's saying to him. Because there's no audio. But then he starts to shoot. And the, the judge gets down in the floor. Uh, he's trying to crawl away, but there's really nowhere to go. If he had been able to come around his desk on the other side, he might maybe have been able to make a run for the door. But I think at that point he had already been shot. It, they said there were multiple gunshots. I don't know how many times he actually shot him and then as he's getting ready to leave the office he turns and the judge is up underneath his desk at this point and he shoots again and so he did kill this judge he comes out it was said that he came out into the by this point the people outside have heard the gunshots and have called and are running scared trying to you know figure out what's going on here now, within minutes of this story breaking, within minutes of this story breaking, social media was aflame with stories of the judge was inappropriately having a relationship of some sort with this sheriff's teenage daughter. Now, whether this was true or not, I don't know where they got that from. I don't know if this was something that was hush-hush talk you know, behind closed doors within that community. But it was said in court that 
When he asked the, sh the judge for his phone, he started to call his daughter's phone number, and the number came up as a saved number in the judge's phone. Now, does this mean that this judge and this teenage girl were having some type of relationship? I don't know. I haven't heard any more details on that other than rumors. The family has denied this. It's also possible that he was inappropriate. But now there's another element to this story. This sheriff was named in a lawsuit, and I'm going to read this. The preliminary investigation indicates Letcher County Sheriff Sean Mickey Steins shot District Judge Kevin Mullins multiple times following an argument. Judge Mullins, age 54, died at the scene, and Mickey Steins, age 43, surrendered without incident. Now, it was said that when the state police, and I don't know who said, who heard this, so maybe someone outside the courthouse, someone who worked at the courthouse may have overheard this said. Maybe he said it to someone. They were trying to kidnap my wife and daughter. And... He had some reason to believe that his family was in danger. At least that was what he indicated. September the 16th, only a few days before this took place, the sheriff was deposed in a federal lawsuit. Sheriff Steins was de deposed in a lawsuit filed by two women. But the lawsuit was filed by two women, one of whom alleged that former Letcher County Deputy Sheriff Ben Fields forced her to have relations, S-E-X, relations inside Judge Mullins' chambers for six months in exchange for her staying out of the jail. Now, he was in charge of their ankle monitor. So Ben Fields, Deputy Sheriff, forced these women to have relations with him in order to stay out of jail. The lawsuit accuses Deputy, or rather Sheriff Mickey Stunts, of deliberate indifference in failing to adequately train and supervise him. Now, these trias, these these forced, basically forced what I would call um, assaults, basically, on these women were taking place in the judge's chambers during the nighttime hours when this sheriff would be, or deputy rather, would be there working at the court. And he would bring these women there. He said the reason he took them into this office was because there were no cameras. But there were cameras on the day of the shooting, so did they decide to put these cameras up after they found out that this sheriff deputy was doing this? So the lawsuit accuses the sheriff of, of not, knowing what was happening or turning a blind eye to it. According to the Mountain Eagle, which is a newspaper in Letcher County, Fields, Deputy Sheriff Ben Fields, was a court security officer in Letcher County, and he worked for Eastern Kentucky Correctional Services, which provides the electronic monitoring devices to prisoners who are on home incarceration. The complainants, the women, allege that Fields assaulted them, raped. I'm just going to say the word. Sometimes YouTube will try to block certain words, but this is basically what this was, regardless of whether they went there because they wanted to stay out of jail or they went there because he pretty much blackmailed them or forced them. It's still the same. It's still the same. And so these women were assaulted during their home incarceration as what they called favors to avoid getting fines or going back to jail and because of their inability to pay for their ankle monitors. So Steins fired Fields for conduct unbecoming after the lawsuit was filed in 2022. In 2024, Ben Fields pled guilty to third-degree rape, third-degree sodomy, 
two counts of tampering with a prisoner monitoring device, and second-degree perjury. He was sentenced to six months in jail and six and a half years of probation. On September the 19th, Mullins and Steins reportedly had a lunch meeting along with several other people at Streetside Grill in downtown Whitesburg. According to the late According to the lead investigator in the Kentucky State Police Detective, Clayton Stamper, Stamper testified that a witness said the judge was overheard asking the sheriff if they needed to meet privately in his chambers. A 10 to 15 second surveillance video played during the hearing shows Steins, who was once sitting down in front of the judge's desk, he uses his cell phone to call someone, and then he asks Judge Mullins for his phone, and he makes a phone call. Now, Stamper testified that both of these phone calls were made to the sheriff's daughter. But for whatever reason, he called her. I don't know if they spoke or not. Maybe he wanted to confirm that she would answer the phone. Then he takes the judge's phone, makes the same phone call, and as he's dialing the number, a saved number comes up in his into the judge's phone that is this girl. Now, we all know that if you start calling those numbers, if you have that number saved, it's going to come up as a contact. Moments after the calls were made, the video shows the sheriff stand up from his chair and points his gun at the judge. He shoot now he's fighting this, and he's even though there's video footage of him shooting this judge, he's using this defense that he felt his family was in danger. He said they were trying to kidnap my wife and daughter. Now, according to some people who worked there in the courthouse, um, they said that in the weeks leading up to this shooting that Mickey Steins had lost quite a bit of weight, that he seemed to be worried about something, he, his demeanor changed, he seemed to be a little bit paranoid or just kind of um, reserved. He didn't really have a whole lot to say, and he just kind of seemed to close off. There was an incident that took place in the county, and the local um, TV station wanted to come and interview him. And when he spoke to people at the courthouse, he was said to, they said that he told them, don't talk to them until I get there. Don't speak to anybody until I get there. So they just saw this change in him. They saw this kind of worried um, demeanor. And the fact that he had lost about 40 pounds over a period of a, of a few weeks. So did he have something on his mind? Had he found out that something was going on involving his daughter? And maybe he didn't know who it was, but he had a, a suspicion. Maybe he found out something was going on with his daughter. And during those weeks, he was investigating it, looking into it, trying to get into her phone records, and which as the parent, I would just assume that she was probably on a family plan. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but maybe he did get the records and see that she was making phone calls back and forth with this judge. Maybe text messages or maybe the, her mom got her phone and looked through it. I don't know. Maybe these details will come out later during this court um you know, during the trial. But either way, something had changed in him, according to people that he worked with, and um, he made that fatal decision that day to, um, you know, shoot and kill this judge. Now, this upcoming court case could have played a role in this. The sheriff has been charged with a Class A felony, which could be punishable by 20 years to life in prison. Making these videos and talking about these stories and the horrors that these people go through, it kind of puts your own life into perspective, and you start looking at people around you, and you start 
really realizing that sometimes we do surround ourselves with people that maybe are not great for us. And maybe sometimes we are not great for other people. But I've also discovered that it, um, we have to be true to ourselves. And this is something that took me a very long time to figure out. And um, just like in this case, these two men were friends. They knew each other very well over the years. Now, was there corruption going on there? This will hopefully, you know, if there was, it will come out. I think that Judge Mullins had always been given a good name by the community, but we also find out that sometimes people with the best names um, have the biggest secrets. I'm not saying that that's the case. I don't know if there's any truth to any of this stuff about the daughter. Um, you know, if this sheriff decides to bring all this up and talk about this and, and this be his defense, then I guess we'll find that out. The best, kindest, most heartfelt, hardworking, loving, kind neighbor, a friend, and community member as you can be, but you may cross paths with one or two people in your life that you're going to have indifferences with, you're going to have you're going to have problems with. And I can honestly say that at this point in my life right now where I sit here, I don't have a problem with anybody. There may be some people out there that have problems with me. Anything anybody has to say about me is from my past. And it's in my past and it is in the, it's behind me. So anything that anyone out there may bring up about me it's something that they're harboring. It's something that they're carrying. And all we can do is our best in life. All we can do is try to... I, I made a, a very good decision, I feel, several years ago to clear people from my path. People that I once called friends and even some family members. I cleared from my path because when people throw um, stones in your path, when they throw stones at you, when they say things about you and they try to harm you in some way, the only thing you can do is either retreat or clear, that, clear those people out of your way to move forward in life. And that's what I've tried to do. But I'll wrap this video up and say I'm going to get on to business as usual. I'm going to keep working on these upcoming videos. I hope that everyone will return to watch. I appreciate your time. I know YouTube is um, very diverse and there's a lot of stuff out there to look through. And I just appreciate those of you who take the time to give my channel some attention. Thanks for watching.